I'm gonna start off with a review of, of this material that we covered towards the end of class last time. Okay, so last time we had just started on looking at polynomial functions and polynomial functions have two forms. The first form of the polynomial function, I'm gonna to refer to as factored form. And in this form, the function usually will have some leading coefficient. So I'll just put the letter A out here because in the past, when we talked about transform, uh, transformations of functions, we use the letter A to describe the vertical stretch. And that's exactly the role that this number is playing. Uh, but usually these polynomial functions will have polynomial factors like X minus some number. So I'm just gonna put, uh, just because I need another letter here, I might put, let me use a different color, B. And that would be a linear function because I only have one factor here or, or the, um, the variable X is raised to the one power. But if I wanted to multiply that by another polynomial factor, let's say X minus some other number, doesn't really matter what that number is. Then as soon as I multiply that additional X into this equation, well, now I have X to the second power. So that would be a quadratic. And I can continue multiplying polynomial factors into this thing to get like a cubic uh, function if I wanted to. So A, B, C, D, maybe would be the number that would be here and so on. So these polynomials can have a number of different um, polynomial factors. Uh, and when we need to, something about the factors that's really interesting is that the factors tell us something about the x-intercepts. or the roots of the function's graph. And we'll talk more about this fact here, but that's gonna be a super helpful fact as we start working some more problems with polynomial functions. Um, then there's what you might call standard form, or I will just call this expanded form because I think it makes the most sense if we're comparing it to factored form. Expanded form of a polynomial, well, compared to factored form. In factored form, you would be multiplying these polynomial factors together implicitly, right? Well, I'm not technically multiplying them out, but if I were to explicitly go ahead and distribute out all of these parentheses, then I would get some function that looks something more like uh, a times x to some power. And then usually you add up a bunch of other terms. So you might have like b times x to some other power. And usually we write these as descending powers. So I'll put n minus one. So if this was like x to the third power, then this would be x to the second power. Um, plus, and then you might have some other coefficients like C, and then we'll descend by one more power and so on and so forth. So you just have this long list of terms that are being added and subtracted together, each with their own coefficients. Um, and when we have our polynomial function in expanded form, it's sort of easier to see what the degree of the polynomial is uh, the degree is n, in this case, it would be the highest exponent. And the leading coefficient in this case would be whatever, whatever the value of a is. But that's the overall anatomy of these equations, right? We sort of want to be able to put these equations and connect them to their graphs. And the easiest way to do this is by having some examples, right? So what I wanna do is start off by analyzing some polynomial functions. So let's take a look at some. Um, 
Let's take a look at the one we looked at at the end of class last time. Okay, so let me go ahead and move some of these windows around so I can see clearly. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So this might say, graph the polynomial function using its x-intercepts, y-intercept, and end behavior. And then factor first if the expression, if the function is not in factored form. So we looked at this example where we were given the function f of x is equal to x to the third power plus 6x squared minus 4x minus 24. And I want to point out that this is a list essentially of polynomial terms that are being added or subtracted from each other, right? We have x to the third power, x to the second power, x, and then a constant term. So this has to be an expanded form, and it'll be important for us to be able to identify that, just so that we know what we're looking at, right? Well, these instructions say that it's going to be helpful if we can factor this first. So Whenever you have four terms, back in the day, we learned if you have a polynomial with four terms, let's go ahead and write this by factoring by grouping. I'm going to look at the first, uh, first two terms and the second two terms and factor out their greatest common factor. Okay, so I'm just rearranging the function. I'm not changing the value of the function. I'm just writing it in a different form. So these two terms have an x squared in common. So I'm going to pull out the x squared. And that'll leave me with x um, plus 6. These two terms have a minus 4 in common. And that will also leave me with an x plus 6. So now that these two factors here match, that means that looking at this term and this term, their greatest common factor is going to be x plus 6. And that means the remaining factor is x squared minus 4. So I could stop there and say that this is our function. But I want to make sure that you fully factored your expression. Fully factor. Okay, and if I'm looking at this expression right here, well, that looks like a difference of squares factorization. So if I have a squared minus b squared, that can factorize into a plus b and a minus b. So this one factor actually can be factored further, we'll get x plus 2 and x minus 2. Now, if that went a little bit fast for you or applying this uh, formula is a little bit uh, crazy or it seems like it came out of nowhere, then what I would do is recommend, you know, on your own time, go back and multiply these two factors together, like distribute these terms out and see if you don't get this original factor. You'll see that these two things are equivalent. And so our completed factored form of our function 
is this thing. And I'll give you guys a little bit of time to catch up, catch your breath a little bit. Okay, so does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns up to this point? This is not the answer, right? We're, our instructions say graph the polynomial using its x-intercepts, y-intercepts, and end behavior. So this is really just uh, pre-processing the function so that it's in a form that will be usable for us. But does anybody have any questions up to this point or any points of confusion that you guys need me to clarify? So how did he how did he get the x plus six again in the beginning? Um, so I looked at the first two terms mm -hmm. and the last two terms, right? Okay. So if we just look at the first two terms, they both have x squared in common. Okay. So if I factor out x squared, I would need to multiply it by x here so that I can get the x to the third power back, mm -hmm. and multiply it by the six here to get the six oh. x squared back. So that's just factoring out their greatest common factor. Okay, I see. And the Thank same you. thing over here, these two terms have a negative four in common. So when I factored that out, I need X plus six in order to get the original two terms back. Oh, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, like I said, this is just pre-processing the question. We want to get this function in factored form because it will be so much easier for us to find the x-intercepts when this thing is in factored form. Okay, right now we could, we could definitely tell what the end behavior of this function is. So if we wanted to, we could say the end behavior of this function uh, should be something like, well, you haven't seen what I written. I wrote, uh, the end behavior should look like this. Can anybody tell me why the end behavior should be like that? Does anybody remember? Because it's the X because the degree is three. Yes, the degree is three, which is odd. And then the sign of the leading coefficient is positive. So that's why we can tell based on our end behavior diagram from last time that this is what the function should look like. It should look and behave more or less like a cubic function at least on the ends. We'll see that the middle of the function or the middle of the graph uh, can wiggle around a bit, uh, but that's why we're graphing the function or sketching a, a graph of the function, okay? But now that we have the end behavior, uh, we should probably find the x-intercepts. So I'm gonna write the function down again, but this time I'm gonna leave it in factored form. We have x plus six times x plus two times x minus two. And since this is multiplication, it doesn't matter what order you put these polynomial factors in, okay? Um, either way, it's gonna produce the same function, the same graph. We know that the end behavior will look something like this, but we wanna find the x-intercepts now. Does any, anybody remember how we find the x-intercepts? Uh, do we equal to zero? Yeah. The x plus six equals zero, and then we get the value for x for all of them. Exactly. So what, what technically is going on here is that remember that the x-intercept, so like if I drew just a generic graph, any graph, uh, this doesn't even relate to this function that we're working with. But I'm just going to draw a graph here. I might not know exactly what x values my x-intercepts are at. 
But if we're talking about x-intercepts, that is wherever the graph is crossing the x-axis, I do know that the y value is equal to zero for every single one of these. So what I'm saying is that, remember, uh, since we're talking about functions and f of x is equal to y, what I can do is set, if I know y is equal to zero, then that means I can just set my function equal to zero. Okay. Well, if I do that, if I set my function equal to zero and my function is just a bunch of polynomial factors, then I would be setting this as x plus six times x plus two times x minus two and setting that equal to zero, right? Because this is my function and I set it equal to zero. Well, in the past, when we were solving quadratic equations, we introduced the zero factor property, right? And that was a very general statement and very simple but powerful tool for us. Because if we have these factors and they're multiplying together to give us zero, that means that one or all of them have to equal zero. So in order to solve for x, we are just going to set each of them equal to zero. So we have these three little linear equations that we have to solve. And these are really straightforward to solve, right? You just move the six over to the other side. So you get x is equal to negative six. You move the, the positive two over to the other side. So you get x is equal to negative two. And you move the, the negative two over to the other side you get x is equal to positive two. So if these are the x values that I get, keeping in mind that y is equal to zero, then the ordered pairs that I get are negative six comma zero, negative two comma zero, and positive two comma zero. Since they all are x-intercepts, they all have a y value of 0. And these are points that exist on the, the graph of the function. So now I have three points that I can plot, and I can start to make out what this graph is, is going to look like as I draw my sketch. OK, so all of these guys are x-intercepts. And they're written as ordered pairs. So that's why they're x comma y. So when we looked at the function originally, it wasn't in factored form. And we could leave it like that and find the end behavior just fine. Um, but we want to get that function into factored form because it makes it so much easier for us to find these x-intercepts, right? Because once it's in factored form, you are literally just setting those factors equal to 0, solving those little equations. And then you have the x values for your x-intercepts. So that's three points down. Uh, we can start to graph this function, but I'm going to go ahead and say, let's hold our horses before we start sketching. Let's find the y-intercept. Okay. So does anybody have any questions up to this point for finding the x-intercepts? Okay. So again, I'm going to go ahead and write the function down. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's in factored form or expanded form. Sorry, had a brain fart for a second. Uh, let's go ahead and leave it in, in factored form just because I think that we want to be consistent and just like not confuse you guys with anything. So I'll leave it as, um, what was this guy in factored form? X plus six, X plus two, and X minus two, right? And we want to find the y-intercept. 
over here, I'm going to make a little box just to write down the things that we have so far. So we know that the end behavior looks like this. We know that the x intercepts are um, negative 6, 0, negative 2, 0, and 2, comma, 0. OK. And again, I'm just going to draw a generic graph here. It has nothing to do with our polynomial. I don't even know what our polynomial looks like yet. But just in general, if we're talking about y-intercepts, let me draw a squiggly line, boom, OK? Let's say that, that we had a general function, and we were just focusing on finding the y-intercept. That is where the graph is crossing the y-axis, OK? I don't know what the y-value is here. But do I know what the x value is? It's 2. Why do you say it's 2? Because we have the x-intercept is 2, 0. Oh, yeah. But remember, the x-intercepts over here describe points that are on the x-axis. So they're not related to this point here. Right, like this would be at negative six and zero. So if we, again, this is not our graph, but let's just pretend that that was x equals negative six. This is x equals negative two, and this is x equals two. Those are not the points that we're concerned about right now. We're trying to find the point where the graph crosses the y-axis. And I don't know its y value, but I should know its x value. Does anybody know what the x value of that might be? Yeah. yeah, x should be equal to 0 there, because it's on the y-axis. Any point on the y-axis has an x value of 0. So if we're looking for the y-intercept, then automatically we should know that x is equal to 0 without anybody telling us. Okay. So that means we can plug this value into our function for x and then find the corresponding y value, right? So if f of x is equal to our y value, then I can plug this x value into the function. f of 0 is what I'm looking for, which is telling me plug 0 into each of these x's. So I have 0 plus 6 times 0 plus 2 times 0 minus 2. I'll go ahead and solve this and simplify it so I can see what is the value, the y value that we'll get, OK? So we want to use our order of operations. Just because we have a 0 in here, don't automatically assume that we're multiplying everything by 0. Because this is not multiplication. This is saying, take 0, plug it into the function, right? That's how you should interpret this thing. We're not solving anything on the left-hand side. This is just purely notation. We're simplifying the right-hand side of the function. And if we were to simplify that, we need to do the parentheses first, exponents, blah, 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 do all of the PEMDAS or, or GEMDAS, your order of operations, and then simplify your expression. So 0 plus 6 would just be 6. 0 plus 2 would just be 2. 0 minus 2 would be negative 2. And we're multiplying those guys together. So if we just multiply these three numbers together, we should get negative 24. And this is our y value. So if that's the y value that we have, then our y-intercept as a location on the graph has an x value of 0, which is what we plugged in and a y value of negative 24. So that is our y-intercept. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns about this portion?
Okay, and again, don't get confused with this graph that I did here. This is not at all related to our actual problem, but it's just a general idea that wherever the graph, the pink line crosses the y-axis, the x value is always going to be zero. It just so happens that our actual problem crosses the y-intercept somewhere down here at zero, negative 24. Right, that's what this is telling me. So let's put all of our pieces together now that we have the end behavior, we have x intercepts, and we have the y intercept. So I'm going to draw a sketch of our graph space. Right, going to start with my x axis. Going to start my y axis. I don't know what I need to number this off as, so I'm just going to put some tick marks. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. 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 And I'll figure out the numbering scheme later, right? As I start to plot some of these points. So let me write down what we have. We have that the end behavior should be the squiggly cubic function. We have the list of our x-intercepts. which is negative six and zero. We have negative two and zero, and we also have two and zero. Now our y-intercept is pretty low. It's at zero comma negative 24. Okay, so if that's the information that I wanna graph right now, uh, the y-intercept should sort of tell you what, how you should scale the y-axis. So this is our function axis or our y-axis. Obviously, this is our x-axis over here. Zero and negative 24, that means I would have to go down 24 spaces, but I don't have enough tick marks, really. So let me just count by sixes here and say this is negative six negative 12, negative 18, negative 24. I'm going to say that this is negative 24 there. And I'm going to put a dot. That takes care of my y-intercept. I might be safe to go ahead and maybe count by twos on the x-axis, just to make it a little bit nicer. Um, you could count by ones. I don't think that that would make a whole lot of difference. Let's just count by ones. Uh, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, and negative six is out here. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, and six out there. And we just need to be able to plot these points, right? Negative six and zero would be all the way out here. Negative two and zero would be right here. And two and zero is here. Uh, you might be wondering how I'm graphing them so quickly. If you remember, these are the x-intercepts. They should be on the x-axis. And if you remember that this one is the y-intercept, it should also be on the y-axis. Okay. So you don't want to like confuse yourself and then go like down negative six and put a point there or something like that. So just be careful when you're plotting those things. Okay, so I graphed my four points for this polynomial. Let me write the function one more time in factored form, just because I like to have the function with us. X plus six, X plus two, and X minus two. Okay. The end behavior says that on the ends of this function, right? So if these are the two x-intercepts that are on the left and the right ends, the end behavior should be going down to the left and up to the right. So I'm literally just going to draw this diagram on the ends of the function. So the function should look something like this and then something like this. I don't really care about it, you know, being precise here just trying to get the general feel, a general sketch of this graph. And now I need to figure out what's going on <clears throat> in the middle of this graph. Like what happens between these two points? What happens between these two points? And then what happens between these two points, right? 
<clears throat> and so one thing that you could do is definitely graph your function into Desmos and see what happens. Um, and then you could connect the, the points accordingly because we're just trying to get a rough sketch of our function. Another thing you could do is think about this new concept that I'm going to introduce called multiplicity, which is just a fancy word for the exponent on the polynomial factor. So the polynomial factors of your function. And so this idea of multiplicity or the exponents that are on these factors, remember, this is a factor, this is a factor, and this is a factor. The exponents will tell you something about the behavior At, of the graph at the x-intercept. So if, for instance, you had, this is my x-intercept. I'm just going to draw a little diagram. Let's say I had an x-intercept here. If this factor was x minus some number, let's say x minus a, and it didn't have an exponent, well, then I would know that this is an automatic exponent of one on that factor. What the graph looks like is that your graph will pass right through the x uh, axis like a straight line because this is a linear factor. So the behavior of the function at that x-intercept is gonna be linear. And that's to contrast it with Let's say you had an x-intercept somewhere else that was generated by a factor that looks something like this. And the exponent on that one was two. Or we said that this was a quadratic factor. Well, if this is a quadratic factor, then instead of crossing over the x-axis, you would get a bouncing effect. In, in effect, what, what the behavior of the function would look like at the x-intercept would be like a quadratic function. It would look like a parabola. So when I talk about this, I'll sometimes say, because the multiplicity of this factor is one, you're gonna cross over the x-axis. But if you had a multiplicity of two, then you would just touch the x-axis and then bounce off in the same direction. So I would call this a bounce. If the multiplicity was three, so you had some other factor where you had x minus c, but it was raised to the third power, then the function would sort of uh, squiggle through sort of like a cubic function. OK, so again, this is specifically the behavior at the x-intercepts. So this is sort of going to guide us as far as what's happening on the inside of the function. So let's look at our function again. We have this factor here. And this factor corresponds to this x-intercept. This factor corresponds to this x-intercept, right? This one generated this x-intercept. Now I'm just putting the, the dotted line there just so that you can make that connection. If we look at x plus six, there's no exponent on it right now. So that means that if we use this little diagram, our exponent is one. So as our graph crosses through this x-intercept, it should just cross straight through. So we should cross over the x-axis. I'm not going to connect it to this point yet, because I want to make sure that we have the correct behavior at this x-intercept. 
So this x-intercept comes from this factor, which also has an exponent of 1. In fact, all of their exponents are 1. So that means that the behavior at this x-intercept should just cross over. And I'm crossing down this way because we're coming from above. So it'll cross down. Um, this will go all the way down, touch this point, and then it'll change directions. And at this x-intercept right here, we should cross back up through. So in general, we should be getting some behavior that looks something like this. Not particularly complicated, it sort of still looks like a cubic function. But we're getting that crossing effect here, here, and here, because the multiplicity on each of these factors is one. And that's a rough sketch of what our function looks like. Feels like a lot. We want to look at another example so that we can see something that's a little bit more complicated. Because right now we were just dealing with these crossings at the x-intercept. We want to see like, what is an example of where we're going to bounce at the x-intercept or we're going to sort of squiggle through the x-intercept. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll have these uh, examples. We'll get to them next. But what I want to do is graph this thing in Desmos and see, you know, does our sketch more or less look like what the function is supposed to look like? Okay, so let me share my screen. All right. Go to Desmos. Let me turn this one off. And our function f of x, if we put this into factored form, x plus 6 was one of our factors. x plus 2 is another factor. And x minus 2 is one of our factors. OK, so that's all three of our factors. If I zoom out, it looks kind of skinny. I'm going to change the scale. Um, it looks like, yeah, that's correct. Let me go ahead and change the scale. The y-axis, I'm going to make this go down to negative 30. And then make it go up to positive 30, I think will be fine. But I want to widen this out a little bit, really uh, n make these boundaries a little bit more narrow, because it looks like we're between negative 10 and 10. So I'll put this as negative 10 and 10 just to widen that out a bit. And so our displays, it looks a little bit better. Let me go ahead and thicken this thing up. There we go. And you can see from our graph, we have an x-intercept right here at negative 6, negative 2, and 2. Uh, our y-intercept is down here where it crosses the y-axis at 0, negative 24. So those are all correct. And our end behavior is correct too. Uh, and our general shape is good, right? My, my sketch is a little bit bad. It's a little bit wiggly here where it shouldn't be, but that's okay. Uh, as long as we have the, the critical features, that is the x-intercepts, the y-intercept, and the overall behavior, I really don't care what's going on in the middle. Uh, you could see that Desmos puts a peak right here and a valley down here. So if you wanted to be super precise, you could plot those uh, more precisely. But again, we just really want a sketch of the critical features and the overall behavior at the ends and now at the interior of the function. But that's, that's pretty much what our sketch looks like. OK. So even though that was like a long-winded presentation of what we're doing, what we're doing is what? We're finding the end behavior. We're finding the x-intercepts, the y-intercepts. Well, actually, there's only one y-intercept. Um, and then we're looking at the behavior at the x-intercepts. So these are the four things that we need to be able to look for when we're graphing or making a sketch of these functions.
So let's do this. I'm going to give you guys about 10 minutes. I'm going to give you this function. Um, and it's already in factored form, so we don't have to factor it. But I want you to, in that time, figure these things out. And then we'll come together and we'll draw a sketch of the graph. Okay. So if you can find these things, and then we'll talk about putting them all together. I'll give you guys about five to 10 minutes to do that. I'm going to be right here if you have any questions at any point, if you get stuck. But definitely, I'm not going to throw you into breakout rooms, but go ahead and ask each other if you get stuck, you know, because talking these out with your, with your classmates is really going to help cement that understanding. Record so we can continue recording this. So I gave you the function in factored form, x times x plus 2 times x minus 1 to the third power. And we should be able to identify that this is in factored form. Uh, we should also be able to identify that the degree of this polynomial is 1, 2, and then there's three x's here technically. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is a fifth degree polynomial, which is odd. The leading coefficient is usually the number that's in the very front of the function. And so the coefficient here, the leading coefficient, is just a 1 because we don't see a number there. It's a positive 1. So the sign of the coefficient is positive. So that tells me that my end behavior should be more or less like this. Okay. Was everybody okay on that or do we still have some questions about finding the end behavior? Okay. So to find the x-intercepts, Once you get pretty adept at identifying the x-intercepts, we know that the x-intercepts and the factors in the polynomial are related to each other somehow. So what you could do is say, you know, you could set this whole thing equal to zero, or you could say, let's skip the middleman and then set x is equal to zero, x plus two is equal to zero, and x minus one is equal to zero. And then we'll solve those things. So this first equation is already solved. So our, as our xy pair, right, um, x is 0, y is 0. So we have 0, 0 for one of our points. If we were to solve this one, you would move the 2 over. So you would get x is equal to negative 2. So we have negative 2 and 0 there. And then this one, you would move the 1 over. So you'd get a positive 1 for the x. And then our y is 0. So don't forget that here is y is equal to 0 for the x-intercepts. Did anybody have any questions about the x-intercepts? Or Yvonne, does that kind of clarify a little bit? I know I even sort of sped through that bit. But that's because I, I don't want you to overcomplicate it. The x-intercepts come directly from the factors. Yeah, yeah, but I have too many zeros. <laughs> that's why it's oh, like Oh, yeah, zeros. there's just a lot of zeros. Gotcha. No, but also in the y, that's... Yeah, that's and so zero. let's take a look at the y-intercept. Okay. The y-intercept, we will have to do a little bit of algebra, and we'll have to remember that for our y-intercept, Uh, there's really no other way to do it other than to set x is equal to zero. Well, if x is equal to zero and you plug that into your function, then what we're looking at is evaluating f of zero, which is telling us 
plug zero into all of the locations for x in the original equation. So we would have zero because we had an x there times zero plus two times zero minus one to the third power, right? And these are just the locations where x was in the original formula. And so we just need to simplify this expression. Well, when you plug zero into a lot of polynomial equations, um, it, it turns out to be a really nice and easy multiplication process. Because if I just look at this, I have zero times something and zero times something else, right? So this first zero is going to be multiplied by two, and this is going to be multiplied by negative one. But since we're multiplying a zero, I can say that right off the bat, I, I know that this value is zero. But if we wanted to simplify step by step, just so that you didn't confuse yourself, you have zero times two times, this would be negative one to the third power, uh, which is still negative one. And then we have, I mean, it depends on how many steps you need for this to feel a little bit more natural, but zero times negative two, and you still get zero. Okay, so that's the y value when our x value is zero. So that means that our, x, our y intercept is x is zero, y is zero. So I'm gonna, well, I'll use a different color. There's our y intercept. And then we need our x intercepts so that we can graph this thing. Any questions? Okay. Well, now that we have those, um, rather than flipping this over, I'm just gonna go ahead and sketch my graph. And again, I always draw my little graph space. I put some tick marks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And honestly, I never know how many tick marks I'm gonna need. I just do the same number in every direction. Uh, and then I figure out what the scale needs to be based on the points that I have. So I have the end behavior for this function. And I know that this thing is sort of related to a cubic function. It's an odd polynomial, so it'll have that end behavior. I know my x-intercepts. Let me go ahead and list them. I have 0, 0. I have negative 2, 0. And I have 1, comma 0. I also have my y-intercept at 0, 0. OK. So you might notice that this x-intercept and this y-intercept are the exact same point. That's perfectly fine. Anytime you have a point that's perfectly at the origin, that is going to be the x and the y intercept. But let's go ahead and plot our points. So we have 0, 0 plotted. That takes care of these guys. Um, we can count by ones on our x axis here. Um, We'll probably count by ones all the way through. But anyway, um, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, and so on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, negative 2 and 0 would be right here. Remember, this is an x-intercept, so I'm putting it on the x-axis. We have 1 and 0 right there. And notice already that I've, I've made, uh, I wouldn't say a mistake, but the points are really close together. So it's going to be really squished in the horizontal direction. So maybe if I had said like this is one half and this is one, I would have spread it out a little bit more. So I would have counted like one, two and counted that as one and then one, two, and that would have been two. But in any case, we're going to go ahead and sketch this thing. Uh, the end behavior says that as I come out of this end, I should be going down. And as I come out of this end, I should be going up. Again, I'm going to write the function up here 
just so that I have it as a reference x times x plus 2 x minus 1 to the third power. OK. Well, this x-intercept, x minus 2, came from this factor, the x plus 2. The x plus 2 factor has a multiplicity or an exponent equal to 1. So that tells me that my graph is going to just cross, cross over the x-axis there. I don't know how high it's going to go or how steep it's going to be, but I know that it's going to cross straight across the x-axis. At this point, this point came from the, the factor x, because we set that equal to 0, so we got the x-intercept at 0. So the multiplicity there again, is just one as well, because we're talking about the exponents on these guys. So I should be crossing the x-axis. If I come up through here, I should be crossing back down through there. And then finally, the last factor, x minus 1, has an exponent of 3. So the multiplicity is 3 which means that based on the little diagram I gave you, we should be squiggling back through the x-axis like a cubic function. So I should be going crossing through here, crossing back through here, and then sort of squiggling up through that function. So it doesn't really matter exactly how high we get. I'm going to cross up, cross back down, go down here somewhat and then squiggle back up through this other point. When we look at this just to verify in Desmos what the behavior of the interior of the function is, uh, it might be higher here. It might be lower here at this peak. It might be lower at this valley. But the behavior at this x-intercept should just be sort of linear. Like if I were to draw a little box right here, and just focus on this little box. And if I were to zoom in just on that little box and ignore all the other parts of the function, we said that this factor, uh, which you can't see anymore, the x plus 2 had an exponent of 1. So this little box here looks like a linear function if you were to zoom in. If you were to draw a little bounding box around this x-intercept, we were to zoom in on that one it also looks like a linear function right there. But if you were to draw a bounding box on this guy, which I know is sort of hard to see, it looks more cubic. OK, so let's take a look at Desmos just to make sure that I'm not talking uh, craziness right now. Can I ask something really quick? Yeah. It's because I had to step away and I didn't hear. How do you get the x plus 1? and the third power, I, I know you get x equals minus 1, right? Is the value for the x. Sorry. Yeah, so when we were doing okay. the x-intercepts, yeah. I, I but this... So we don't have to do the power at all? No. So we don't, no? OK, to get the value for the x? No, no, you don't. Good, good question. Okay. OK, sorry. It's because I, I did that, and it gave me 0. So I was like a little confused. Thank you. OK, yeah, no, no. Um, even if you did use the power, right? Uh, so just let me grab some scratch paper real quick. Even if you did set that equal to x minus 1 to the third equals to 0, right? The proper way to solve that would be to take the cube root of both sides. So you would get x minus 1 is equal to 0. So you would be solving x minus 1 is equal to 0 anyway. So just ignore the exponent there, and you should get x is equal to positive 1, regardless of whether you use the exponent, if that made any sense. If it didn't, and if it's just more oh, confusing. OK, thank you. Yeah. But for anybody else who's listening to that and thought that was more confusing, 
then just forget I said anything, right? I'm not trying to overcomplicate your life. I'm trying to complicate it just the right amount. Okay. So the multiplicity here is really what's telling you the behavior at these X intercepts, right? And that's why I sort of drew this diagram here that the exponent of the factor, if it's just a one at the X intercept, it will just cross through either up through it or down through it, but you'll get that crossover. If it's a quadratic, we'll see a bounce. And if it's cubic, we should see a squiggle through the X intercept. And so in this function, we had a linear factor, another linear factor. And so that's why we cross through here and cross through there. But then at this factor, at the x-intercept of x equals one, we had to squiggle through it like a, like a cubic function, okay? And those are really the only types of multiplicities that you guys are gonna see. Because if I had x to the fourth power here, it would still look like a bounce. Just like when we studied polynomial functions, the even ones look u-shaped, the odd ones look squiggly, okay? Let's do one more of these, okay? Let's look at the function. I can't remember if we did this one last time, but it'll be good practice to run through it again. Yeah, and this one has a, actually let's change it up a little bit. I'm gonna change this one to a three there. So now we have a quadratic factor, we have a linear factor, and now we have a cubic factor. So we're gonna see all three of those behaviors in one graph. And just for the sake of time, I'll run through this with you guys, okay? Um, so the end behavior here, we need to look at the degree of the polynomial and the sign of the leading coefficient. So can anybody tell me what the degree is? Six. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have a six degree polynomial, which is even. So it's gonna be U-shaped. And the sign of the leading coefficient uh, should be apparent that it's positive, right? Because we have a positive two in the front of the function. So the end behavior, if we take this material, uh, we should be looking at a function that goes up on either end. Now the fun part begins. We need to find the x-intercepts. And remember that this is as simple as setting the factors of the polynomial function equal to zero and solving those equations. So, Two is a factor, technically, it's a numeric factor. But if we set that equal to zero, we would get nonsense. So I'm going to just ignore the two. We just need to look at the polynomial factors, the things that have variables. And here, it doesn't matter whether we use the exponent or not. Because if I set x squared is equal to zero, you have to take the square root of both sides and you get a linear, a linear equation that says x is equal to zero. So all I'm gonna do is take not the multiplicity, but just the factors. So I'm just gonna take these three things and set them equal to zero and get the x-intercepts. The first one, whenever you just have an x, is already solved, right? x is equal to zero, well, there's nothing to solve there, x must be zero. So that tells you that your x-intercept is zero comma zero. 
Remember your x-intercepts all have a y value of zero. So you'll see as I run through the column here that we'll have a column of zeros. If I have x plus two is equal to zero and I solve that thing, I would have to subtract two over to the other side. So my x value would be negative two and my y value would be zero because we're talking about x-intercepts. x plus one is equal to zero. Well, if I subtract the one over to the other side, I get negative one and zero there. Because again, x-intercepts have a y value of zero. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? I know I'm not showing any work here, but if you were to draw something like this, I would, I would know what you're doing because like these equations are easy enough that I can see like, okay, yeah, that's just a simple subtract two, subtract one, right? So if you wanted to skip some steps there just for the interest of speed or time, then you could definitely do that here if you know what you're doing. Now, I don't want you to skip steps if you are going to make more mistakes, right? Because I still want you to get the answers correct. Um, we can look at y-intercepts now or the y-intercept. which is we're just setting the function f of x um, and we're plugging in x equals zero into the function. So f of zero is simply saying everywhere there's an x in the equation, put a zero. Two times zero squared times zero plus two, zero plus one, to the third power. Now we're just going to slowly simplify this thing. But if you were, um, you know, astute enough to notice that once I multiply this zero by everything, we're just going to get zero. Well, then your multiplication is already done. But if you want to take the steps to simplify this, you'd have 2 times 0 here because 0 squared is 0 times 0 plus 2 is 2. Uh, 0 plus 1 is 1 raised to the third power would still be 1. And so you would get 4 times 0, which is just 0. OK, so this is telling me that we plugged in 0 for x and we got our output of 0 for y. So this is our y-intercept. So now I have these four points that I can plot on a graph and start to build the sketch of our function. OK, so let's draw our graph. Again, we want to write down our laundry list of, of details for this graph, our end behavior. It's sort of like this, our x-intercepts are 0, 0, negative 2, 0, negative 1, 0. Our y-intercept is 0, comma 0. So we have one point that we know right off the bat. That's the origin. I'm going to space this out a bit. So we have negative 2 and negative 1. So I'm going to put negative 2 over here and negative 1 right there. And those are our x-intercepts. Boom, boom. And the end behavior says that we are coming out of this end and this end like so. But let's look at our function. Two x squared, right? Sorry, I'm just gonna have to make that a weird looking x. X plus two, x plus one to the third power.
So when we solved for this x-intercept, x equals zero, it has a multiplicity of two. So we should see a bounce at x equals zero. So this is technically where x equals zero is located. So if the end behavior says it's coming down this way, then we shouldn't be crossing over uh, the x-axis. We should have some sort of bounce here so that it looks quadratic. So I'm going to draw a little curve that goes up like this to make this guy look quadratic. This um, x-intercept comes from this polynomial factor over here. So I'm going to throw that guy over there. And this factor gave us x is equal to negative 1, that x-intercept. So at that location, uh, we should be cubic or sort of wiggling through here, right? because it's a multiplicity of 3. So as I come down here, it should look sort of cubic like so, and then connect like that. Don't know how high it goes when it connects, but all I know is that it should be sort of cubic and wiggle through the x-intercept there. How did I do that again? Ah, there we go. My bad. Cubic, squiggly. And then finally, this middle factor is linear. So we're just going to be crossing right through. So we're going to go down a little bit on the graph and then just cross straight through like that. So we're crossing straight through the graph because that's a linear factor. So overall, this is what our graph should look like, sort of like this squiggly W shape, where if you zoom in to this intercept, you have like a linear behavior there. If you zoom in to this intercept, you get a cubic behavior there. And if you zoom in to this x-intercept, you get a quadratic behavior there. And then always, uh, I feel like, you know, when you can externally validate this, it always feels a little bit more satisfying. So let me go ahead and throw this function into Desmos. So we have 2x squared. There's our quadratic component. If we multiply in a linear component, x plus 2, get a cubic function. Then we multiply in this cubic component. And that should take us back to an x to the power of 6, x plus 1 raised to the third power. And it sort of zoomed out and flattened a bit. Um, Let's see if we can find some attractive scaling so we can get this to look a little bit more like our function. Um, maybe we want to scale this by from negative three to positive one. It doesn't look like it goes very low at all. So I'm going to go to negative three, positive three for now. And maybe I can make the width of it a little bit smaller. So let's go to 2.5. Let's go to 0.5 there. OK. The x-intercept right here, if you zoom into it, it looks more and more like a linear function. If you zoom into this x-intercept, oh, you can't really tell, but it does look like a really flattened cubic function where it sort of squiggles through the x-intercept there. 
And then here we go. If you were to zoom into the origin further and further, it has this general quadratic shape where you're just bouncing off the x-intercept or the x-axis. OK. Well, there is another type of question that's very similar to these. Uh, in these questions, I gave you equations, and you had to come up with a sketch of the function. Well, let's say they gave you a graph, and you needed to come up with the equation. We're going to use these same concepts, but sort of in the reverse direction to find the equation of the polynomial. And the instructions will often say something like, find the polynomial function of least possible degree having the graph shown. And then they will present you with a graph. Uh, let's do something like this. Um, The graph looks something like this point is at zero, comma, eight. This point is at one, comma, zero. This point is at negative one, comma, zero. And that's all the information that they give us. Is that supposed to be an eight or a negative eight? It is definitely a negative eight because it is below the x-axis. Good catch. Negative one, zero, zero, negative eight, and one and zero. Let me sort of, sorry, I drew it sort of slanted a little bit. Okay. So we have to use the same principles that we just got finished going over, but in the opposite direction, right? Before we were given the equation and had to come up with the graph. Now we're gonna be given a graph and have to come up with the equation. But the principles are really similar. Um, in fact, we will write our function in factored form and call it a day. But can anybody tell me, you know, maybe just guessing or thinking through this issue, we know something about the factors and what they give us when we were when we were given the equation, right? Uh, the factors tell us something about the x-intercepts. So something about these x-intercepts might be able to tell us the factors that that produce them. Okay, so. When you're looking at the graph, the way you're going to need to interpret this is that, OK, the x-intercepts tell us what the factors are. And usually when this thing is in factored form, like I said before, you have some coefficient here. And then usually uh, a bunch of factors that are multiplied by each other. And I couldn't tell you how many factors. It's going to differ from problem to problem. Um, but the first thing we want to do is find the factors for the polynomial. And then we'll be able to find some of the other stuff for the equation. OK. So what you might say to yourself in a problem like this is, um, OK, 
one of the x-intercepts is that x is equal to negative one. And before, when we had the equation and the factors, we set the factor equal to zero and then got the x by itself by moving the number over to the other side. So if we move this number back over to the opposite side so that it's with the x, we'll have the factor for it, right? So if I just added one over here, I would get x plus one is equal to zero. And this guy is one of the factors for my polynomial. So just going in the opposite direction. Similarly, if I had x equals 1 as my other x-intercept, and I wanted to unsolve it and move the 1 over to be with the x, I could subtract 1 from both sides. And I would get the expression x minus 1 is equal to 0, where now the other factor for my polynomial has been discovered to be x minus 1. You might also want to know what the multiplicity of these guys are, right? To know whether or not they have exponents. So x plus 1, x minus 1. So if I zoom into the x-intercept that generated this factor, that is x minus 1, which is here, or x is equal to minus 1 and I zoom in to my behavior here at the x-intercept, what does this look like? What kind of function? Quadratic. It looks quadratic. So that means that the multiplicity must be two there because this is a quadratic behavior at that x-intercept. Same thing over here. We have that quadratic behavior. So the multiplicity on this other factor must also be 2. And since those are the only x-intercepts for this function, these are the only two factors that are in the function. OK, so we're going to put the pieces together. My function must be, must have some leading coefficient, which I haven't discovered yet. But I now know that the factors have to be x plus 1 squared and x minus 1 squared. But notice that they'll give you this other point. Usually it's the y-intercept. They've given us this extra point, which is an x value and a y value. And this is going to be a really useful a point on the graph to help us find the coefficient. So the y-intercept, which in this case is 0, negative 8, will help us find the coefficient for this function. Because This is my y value. And I've been given my x value right here. And I have x's here and here. So what I can do is say negative 8 is my y value. That's equal to, I don't know what the coefficient is. 
So I'm going to leave it as A. But this point says that zero is going to be the X value. So I'm going to put a zero here plus one squared. And then I have zero here minus one squared. And so I only have one missing value, the value of my coefficient. So I've taken my x and y value for my um, y-intercept, and I've plugged the y value here, and I've plugged the x value for all of the x's. And now I just need to solve for a, my leading coefficient. So I'm going to do this one step at a time. There's nothing to simplify on this side of the equation, so I'll just write negative 8 is equal to a. 0 plus 1 is just 1. And 1 squared, well, let me just go ahead and say that this is 1 squared. This is 0 minus 1, so that's going to be negative 1. I still have the exponent of 2. I've done my parentheses. Now I need to take care of the exponents. I have a. 1 squared is just 1. Negative 1 squared is positive 1, so be careful there. And then 1 times 1 times a is just a. And that means that a is equal to negative 8. So this is my leading coefficient now that I've solved for a. So if I put my entire equation back together again, now that I know what my leading coefficient is, the equation for this function, for this graph that they gave us, written in factored form, is going to be our leading coefficient times our x plus 1 squared, don't forget the multiplicity, times x minus 1 squared. And that is the equation that generates the graph. And you could sort of do a little gut check here because these factors tell you that the x-intercepts are at negative 1 and positive 1. It's sort of like the opposite of what you see here. That the behavior at the x-intercept should be quadratic, so we should just bounce against the x-intercept or the x-axis and not cross it. And then the leading coefficient says that it should be upside down because there's a negative sign in front of it. Well, that's exactly what we had when we were given this graph. Quadratic behavior here, quadratic behavior there. The graph is flipped upside down. The end behavior of this thing has a, a degree of what? It has to be an even degree, which 2 and 2 makes 4. So we have an even degree polynomial. OK. Uh, let's let's I'm going to throw another one at you and just sort of throw you into the deep end. This is the way my dad taught me how to swim. We were like two, three years old and he would just take us to the deep end of the, the pool and throw us in. Uh, because if you don't drown, that's equivalent to to swimming. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you a graph. and I want you to find the equation of the polynomial. And it's always going to be like a rough graph. Uh, but the main features are going to be pretty obvious. OK, so this is going to be negative 2, 0 right there. This point is going to be 0, 6. And this point right here is going to be at positive 1. The function looks something like. like this 
and then squiggle through that thing. There we go. So I'll give you guys about 10 minutes to work on this one. Remember that your x-intercepts tell you what your factors are. The behavior at the x-intercepts tells you the multiplicity or the exponent on those factors. And then you're going to use the y-intercept the x and the y value to find the leading coefficient. Is anybody just completely stuck and wants to just get over with it? <laughs> I got f of x equals negative three, <clears throat> and then in parentheses, x plus two, close parentheses, x minus one, close parentheses, and then that's cubed. Um, this might be right. It's looking good. Like those factors look good to me, right? Uh, and the reason why I say this, and I can say it like just by looking, is because I know that we have an x-intercept here at x equals negative 2. So if I were to solve this or unsolve it, I should get the factor x plus 2. If I look at this one, x equals 1, and unsolve that one, I should get this factor as well. Notice that at this x-intercept, we have this crossing over behavior. So that should be a linear factor with an exponent of 1, which you don't have to show. And this one should be cubic, because it's sort of squiggling down through the x axis. Okay, but let's go through the process, right? I'm pretty sure that this this is looking good to me. Uh, so the x intercept or the x intercepts can be found by taking x is equal to negative 2. I drew an arrow last time, but you can think of it as unsolving or rearranging this expression so that we can add the 2 over to the other side. Right, get it set equal to zero. So you would get this expression that says x plus two is equal to zero. Okay. And again, if we observe the behavior at that x intercept, we know that the multiplicity or the exponent on that should be one because it's linear. Right. So if you need to, you can write this note that the multiplicity is just the exponent on that factor. Uh, the other x-intercept is over here, and that was at x is equal to 1. So if we did the same unsolving process and just subtracted that 1 over to the other side, you would get an expression that looks like x minus 1 is equal to 0. Uh, and the multiplicity on that guy, because we're squiggling through the x-intercept there, should be a three, it should be cubic. Right? And so maybe I should write that over here. This is a linear behavior and this is a cubic behavior. So that tells us so far we have a function where we need to find the coefficient, but our, inner, our, our factors for that polynomial are definitely x plus 2 to the 1 power and x minus 1 to the third power. OK, does anybody have any questions up to that point? I'm sorry, how did he, how did he get the 3 again? The third power? You have, uh, to, you have to look at the behavior of the x-intercept. And so the behavior here is squiggling through. When you see that squiggling behavior, it's cubic which tells you that the exponent is 3. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So I, I definitely feel like um, just getting the bones of the equation by looking at the graph can can be pretty straightforward, right? At, you know, when you're first learning this thing, it might be like really crazy where I'm pulling these things from. But it's really just looking at these x-intercepts and getting those factors and their corresponding exponents. Okay. Now the coefficient that we need to find always comes from using the y-intercept. So um, we have our function. I like to use different colors here just so you know where things are coming from. Our function was what x plus two, that was a linear factor, and x minus one, and that was a cubic factor. We need to use the point, which was zero comma six, to find the leading coefficient, which we're calling a. So if this is my x value, and this is my y value, and if f of x is the same thing as y, then I could set this equation as 6 is equal to, well, we need to find a. something plus two, something minus one cubed, but the x's we're going to replace with zero. Those are zeros. Now we're just going to use our order of operations and simplify this expression so that we can solve for the missing variable a. So we have six is equal to a. Zero plus two is just two. 0 minus 1 is negative 1, and we still have that third power. We have to apply the exponent. So negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 will still be negative 1. And then I should be able to simplify this side to get negative 2a is equal to 6, dividing by negative 2 on both sides so I can isolate a. a is equal to negative three. So that's our leading coefficient. Which tells us that our function is negative three times x plus two times x minus one to the third power. That's the completed equation. Okay, so let's take um, let's take about ten minutes. Let's come back at two fifteen, and then we'll get into some new material. I'll start recording. So just for the recording's sake, um, we have seen something that looks sort of like this before, where we have a fraction as a function, and if we have this denominator where this rational function has x plus 4 in the bottom of the function, then there are certain inputs or x values that if you were to plug it into the function, you would run into some trouble. And the trouble we would run into is that if we plugged in a negative 4 into the function, you could plug in a negative 4 here and here. And there would be nothing wrong with plugging that negative 4 into the numerator. You could take negative 4, subtract 1, and then multiply whatever that was by negative 3 and simplify that and get a single number on top. But as soon as you plug the negative 4 into the denominator, you have a problem because then you're, you're being forced to divide by 0. right? So if you recall our discussion of restricted values, that's something that we're going to have to watch out for in these kinds of functions because now that we have a variable in the denominator, it's possible that some input values will force us to divide by 0, and we want to avoid that. Okay, So if we look at this function, the 
then the denominator tells us our restricted value is that x cannot be equal to negative 4. And this is going to manifest in a certain way on the graph, right? This value of x is not in the domain. It's not in the domain of the function. But in any case, we have um, a polynomial on top. It looks sort of linear because we only have one factor up here. Uh, leading coefficient is negative 3. Leading coefficient on the bottom is just a 1, since that's the 1 in front of the x. And again, the degree down here is a 1 also. So you might say that the numerator degree, we might call it n, is equal to 1. And the denominator degree is also equal to 1. So the degree of the numerator n is equal to 1, and the degree of the denominator, I'll call that d, is equal to 1 as well. So they have the same degree. The leading coefficient on top is 3. And the leading coefficient on the bottom is 1. Well, I think that we really need to, to pull up a graph so that we can start to connect the dots here. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys to see what this graph looks like. Let's go to Desmos, clear this guy. Get a new function, make sure that it is a thick boy. There we go. And f of x is equal to, since we have a fraction, I'm just going to hit the backslash button so that I can get the division bar. So I have negative 3 times x minus 1 on top, and I have x plus 4 on the bottom. And I'm zoomed in too far, so let me go to the home screen. And you'll notice that the graph sort of looks like this. But if I zoom out further, there's actually two parts to this graph. But let me throw another feature on this graph really quickly. We said that the restricted value x cannot be equal to 4. Uh, I'm sorry, to negative 4. So let me make a red line here. I'm going to make it a dashed line. I'm going to turn the opacity down so it's going to make it a little bit clear or see through. Okay. So I just want to put this uh, restricted value there. So you can see that the two parts of the graph, the graph of the rational function is broken up into two parts. You have this part down here and this upper part over here on the right side. But they don't seem to be crossing through this vertical line that we've created based on the restricted value. OK, so just as we did with the past, uh, or in the past, let me go ahead and write this down. The restricted value that we get from the function generates what we call a vertical asymptote. OK. Can you guys see what I typed? Yes. OK. So I'm going to write it down also, but you can write down what I've typed. The restricted value or values, because some have multiple restricted values, generate on the graph what's called a vertical asymptote. So there's some vocabulary for us, right? And the vertical asymptote is literally this vertical or this restriction in the domain 
where the graph, the blue part of the graph, that is the graph, um, it cannot pass through that X value because that X value would generate an undefined expression, right? We would be dividing by zero if we plugged in X is equal to negative four. So since we can't plug in X is equal to negative four into our expression, that means that there can't be a corresponding Y value. So there should be no graph that exists in that space. So we're gonna get a gap and our graph will essentially be broken up into two parts. So we need to think about these uh, rational expressions as having multi parts, depending on how many restricted values or how many vertical asymptotes they have. So we have this lower part on the left side of the vertical asymptote. We have this upper part on the right side of the vertical asymptote. But that vertical asymptote comes from the restricted value. And we would say that the equation for the vertical asymptote is x is equal to negative 4. So let me type that out. The equation for the vertical asymptote is x is equal to negative 4. There's another feature, though, on the graph um, that we need to look out for. And that is what's called a horizontal asymptote. So if you scan the graph, it looks like there's a y value that's being excluded from, uh, from the range. Remember, the range is the set of all y values that the, the function picks up as you scan from the top to the bottom, or sorry, the bottom to the top. And so if I put y equals negative 3 in here, let me go ahead and make this uh, a red line as well and change it so it can be a little bit see-through, and I'm going to make it dashed. Uh, let me make that 0.5. There we go. And I'll turn off the vertical. Notice that this line at y equals negative 3 looks like the graph, let's say the lower part of the graph, is ri rising up in the left direction and gets really close to this horizontal asymptote, but doesn't seem to cross. For the top part of the graph, we can trace it all the way down towards the horizontal asymptote. And it sort of trails off to positive infinity, but it doesn't look like it's getting, it looks like it's going to touch, but it just gets really, really close to that horizontal asymptote and doesn't ever technically cross, okay? So there's some Y value that's missing from the range. And the Y value that's missing from the range so what we're going to be calling the horizontal asymptote. So the horizontal asymptote is the y value that the function approaches as x goes to either infinity or negative infinity. So let me write that down. The horizontal asymptote is the y value that the graph approaches as x goes to either negative infinity or positive infinity. And so what I mean by that is that if we were to follow the blue graph in the negative infinity direction, right, to the left, it looks like the graph is getting closer and closer to the y value, which is represented here at negative 3. And if we trace the graph all the way in the positive infinity direction, so all the way to the right, 
the y value looks like it's getting closer and closer to negative three as well. And in this particular equation, the equation for the horizontal asymptote is y equals negative 3. But somehow that negative three is related to the equation that we've been given, right? In the same way that our vertical asymptote is related to the denominator of our function, right? Our denominator was uh, x plus four, right? If we were to set that equal to zero and solve it, we could get our vertical asymptote. So what component of our function tells us something about the horizontal asymptote? Let me get rid of this one, <laughs> right? Well, it would be that leading coefficient, right? The leading coefficient of negative three is the same thing as our horizontal asymptote. And maybe it'll take a little while uh, for these words uh, of a horizontal and vertical asymptote to like start to feel familiar. But we're just talking about this dashed vertical line here, right? Or sorry, horizontal and this dashed vertical line. These things are not features of the graph, but conveniently in your homework, uh, MyLabs Plus will throw them into there so that you can reference them, okay? Okay, so let's let's continue sort of examining these functions or this this particular function. So we have this function, and it's negative three x. Uh, was it minus one over x plus four on the bottom? And what you'll notice is that for all of these functions, the leading coefficient or the ratio of the leading coefficients, the leading coefficient on top is equal to negative three. Uh, the leading coefficient will give you the horizontal asymptote. the factors in the denominator are the things that generate the vertical asymptotes. But remember in the past, we called those restricted values. So I wouldn't care one way or the other if you called it a restricted value. So our horizontal asymptote was at y equals negative three. Our vertical asymptote was at x is equal to negative four. And then one other thing that might be useful is that the factor in the numerator, and there might be more than one factor, tells you the x-intercepts. Right, like if I set the numerator factor equal to zero, x minus one equals zero, you would get x is equal to positive one. And I didn't point that out when we were on Desmos, but let me go ahead and jump back really quickly. 
The lower and left hand side of this graph does not seem to be crossing the x axis at all. It seems to be squarely in the one to the third quadrant. But the upper right hand portion of this graph does seem to cross the y axis here and the x axis there. We'll look at the x intercept. It's one comma zero or x is equal to one. So if we set the factors on the numerator equal to zero, we can find the x-intercept. In the same way that when we were solving polynomial equations or polynomial functions, if you set those factors equal to zero, you get the x-intercepts. So what we need to be able to do is, um, given a graph of these things, we need to be able to analyze the graph and then come up with an equation for the rational function. OK, so I'm going to give you a graph. And I'm going to walk you through the steps and, and the thought process for finding the equation for these rational functions. OK, so I'm just going to draw a really rough sketch here. I'm going to do my best. And the graphs of these things will be obvious and they'll point out um, where the vertical and horizontal asymptotes are. This is a one, two, three, four. And the graph looks something like this. I'm gonna put a dashed line, dashed vertical line for where my vertical asymptotes are. And then as usual, I will use my purple highlighter to draw the function. So we have this middle part of the function, which seems to do this. Tried to make that a little bit more symmetric, but And then the other portion, we have a horizontal asymptote here at two. This is negative five. This is positive five. And it looks like our graph is going down like this. Okay. Okay. So if you're given a graph that looks like this, you'll be asked to find the vertical asymptotes. So can anybody tell me what the equations for the vertical asymptotes are just by looking at this graph? X minus four and X plus four. Yeah. So all you would do is say x is equal to negative four. That's one of your vertical asymptotes. Again, it's just going to be a vertical dashed line here. And then x is equal to positive four. Right, you don't want to overcomplicate it. You're just looking for the vertical dashed line. And what x value does it cross through? In other words, what what is the what what looks like its restricted value, you know? And it's restricted in the sense that the graph does not cross that x value. It seems to skip over that section of the graph. Okay, now can anybody tell me what the horizontal asymptote is? 
Will it be four? Uh, why do you think it's four? Uh, I was just looking at the Y axis. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we're looking for specifically where there's a dashed line on oh. the Y axis. So oh. do you care to take another shot? Uh, two? Yeah, it's two, right? right? So you're looking specifically for where they throw that dashed line here, right? That looks like a Y value that's not included in the range because the graph goes from negative infinity, goes up towards two, but doesn't ever cross two. And then it skips up here to three and then continues going up. So that Y value is sort of excluded from the range or a better way to think of it is as the graph goes towards negative infinity in the X direction, we're getting closer and closer to two. As we go towards infinity, we're getting closer to the Y value of two. So Y equals two is gonna be your equation for the horizontal asymptote. Can anybody tell me what the x-intercepts are for this graph? I tried to make them obvious. Five minus phi and phi? Yeah x is equal to negative 5, and x is equal to 5, right? If you wanted to write them as an ordered pair, you could as negative 5 and 0, and 5 and 0. But I'm just going to go with, with these values here. This is where our x-intercepts are. So I can sort of use this information to build my function. So how to build a rational function. The overall scheme of it is that you'll have a function that is a fraction. The factors in the denominator come from your vertical asymptotes. Your numerator factors will come from your x-intercepts. And then the leading coefficient, whatever the leading coefficient is, and it could be a fraction. So I'm just going to sort of split it across there. Um, this comes from the I'm going to put HA for horizontal asymptote. So if I start to build this function out, I'll have, well, one, I'll have a horizontal asymptote of two. So that's going to be my leading coefficient on top. Your x-intercepts are x is equal to negative 5 and x is equal to 5. So if I wanted to get the factors for those, I would unsolve them, right? So if I added 5 to both sides of this equation, I would get x plus 5. And if I subtracted the 5 over to the other side of that equation, I would get x minus 5. So remember, these come from your x-intercepts. Finally, the bottom of the function is going to be built from the vertical asymptotes. And since we have these, we could do that same process of unsolving them. So the first one, if I added 4 to both sides of those, I would get x plus 4 is equal to 0. And then this one would give me x minus 4. And that would be it. That would be how you build the function. OK. 
Okay, so I know that we don't have a lot of time here and we didn't have a whole lot of time to get into the nitty gritty of rational functions, but the main parts of your homework are simply this. They will ask you to find the vertical asymptote, find the horizontal asymptote, and then they'll ask you things uh, that are akin to building the function based on the graph or selecting the correct equation based on a graph where they'll give you a multiple choice of different equations. And you have to go through this process of using these three pieces of information to start building your function and just match it to the answer choices that they give you. Okay, so there's not a whole lot more that I could show you here aside from doing more examples, right? But if you do want to see more examples of these kinds of problems, then I urge you strongly to come to Math World to, to work with me and we'll go through more example problems. Um, so that being said, uh, I'm going to complete creating the test, test number uh, four tonight. It should be up tomorrow. And then once it's up, I'll send a message out and